Bitcoin's price has reached about on 48,000 euros. That's in dollars, approximately 57, 58, maybe, you know, going towards $60,000. So we can see, you know, everything is playing out as predicted. And so I'm really excited, really looking forward to announce my next talk, uh, panel discussion with Dave Collum, professor of organic chemistry, but a huge, you know, great critical thinker uh, outside, you know, Bitcoin's eco chamber. And together with Eric Kaysen, a crypto anarchist, uh, director of client services at Unchained Cap and a brilliant writer on crypto sovereignty, on individual sovereignty, on Bitcoin, on freedom. And together with Eric Vasco, uh, as you know, he's a ex uh, uh, flight instructor, uh, combat flight instructor and what have you. Uh, you know, he's a real genius in a lot of fields, whether it be uh, coding or Bitcoin security or rational economics. So make sure you read his book on crypto economics, uh, fundamental principles on, of Bitcoin. So without further ado, this is my talk, and we're going to go d deep down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin versus nation states, central banks, and the military industrial corporate complex, and other you know, very essential questions, which we need to talk about without taboos. So hope you're going to enjoy this and let me know if you have any questions afterwards. All right. Hope you're going to enjoy this. Bye. Hey, this won't be confusing. <laughs> well, Not a bit. <laughs> that works. You can just emphasize the K sound at the end when you talk to us, Kayvon. Eric. Eric. You also just call me Kaysen too. That works fine for me. Mr. Kaysen. Yeah. So, hey, thank you guys so much for coming to my show. It's uh, really excited because um, I think the, the three of you have um, a really perfect complementary knowledge and perspectives on a lot of issues I want to talk about. We're not going to get through all of them, but uh, there's a core theme or topic I want to talk about. So, David, uh, or Dave, could you introduce yourself a little bit? You're a professor of organic chemistry, just a little bit of background. I mean, I've been following you for lots, lots of a long time, reading your newsletters. You're a critical thinker, and you've made some remarks and statements on Twitter that triggered the discussion. Um, <laughs> you call that a discussion, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Only so far we can go with those 20, what, 240 characters. Yeah, well, I got my ass kicked by the, by the students last spring. Um, Yes, I'm an organic chemist. I was a Cornell undergrad. I was a genetics major. Recognizing the field was dead, I moved on. Um, went to Columbia to do organic, did organic for years. Around the mid, early mid 90s, as a boomer, I sort of woke up, started watching markets in earnest as after I'd amassed some wealth. And, uh, and then by mid 99, I was uh, deeply concerned about the markets and what was more stroke of luck than genius. I was listening to the right guys and I emptied equities and went into gold. And, um, and once you go bearish, it's very hard to unbear yourself. I mean, it, it's an extremely difficult thing to become euphoric again. And uh, so I never really did. Um, I can defend it, but um, my best decade ever was 2000 to two, the end of 2009. I had an extraordinary decade owning uh, energy and gold and uh, and then, uh, and then I pretty much sat out the last decade of the equity ro roid rage. I still am convinced, right? This is stubbornness of higher order. I still convinced they're gonna give most of it back. I think we're gonna have one of those big 80 percenters down and it could become a 90 percenter because they're gonna push it higher yet. But I, I, I my math says the S&P ought to be sitting around a thousand or 1200. So that, that's dark. But it's also just based on the numbers. It's it's not based. It, you just look at earnings and stuff, and you say where should it be based on historical metrics. So I put it at around twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. Would you call yourself a gold bug? At this point, I hate it. I'd really rather own productive assets. But uh, yes, I'm a gold bug at this point. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you straightforward: What's your position on Bitcoin? Like. Uh, because you you do admit like uh, like Godfrey Bloom also you know he's a critical thinker I respect him a lot. He's, uh, you do admit you know you don't know that much about Bitcoin or you maybe don't understand the complexities or you know right. the fundamental principles. 
because is, if, if, if these are like def definitions we need to predefine, uh, that would, you know, Eric Vasco would be the best. If you have any questions, I think Eric Vasco would be the best to ask him, you know, before we go into the topic. Well, sir, I understand the, um, the motivation. I, I think I understand the basics of it. There's things that still confound me a little bit about it, like the, um, the energy cost, it's not so much that it consumes energy, which it does, but at some point, it seems to me that cost is going to be shouldered by a system that's no longer wallowing in appreciation. And, and, then, I, and then I wonder where that, who pays that bill then. Uh, someone cited the other day, said it costs 10 bucks per transaction of energy, and I'm going, that, 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 that's a funny problem. I don't know if that's true, but I just remember seeing someone say it. Um, I, I, I'm not a hodler. I'm not... Um, likely to become one because I, I've said, okay, I'm going to go old fashioned. Um, I got into a lot of grief when I said, look, I don't need five fold up. I'm happy with 20%. Uh, and and the, the, what, what I call the crazy hodlers, right? You guys are not the crazy hodlers. I totally understand your mindset. I totally understand what you're defending against. Um, the crazy hodlers are the ones who think there is no downside. There is no risk. Those, those guys need a lobotomy or something. Um, there's risk in everything. I don't. I know of no asset class that doesn't have risk, and I've I've never had a great idea that didn't feel incredibly scary when I had it. And so, uh, and so, um, here's what would have happened to me. I would have bought it at some price. I first started looking around ten bucks. I would have bought it. Would have gone to fifty. I wouldn't have understood it well enough. I would have sold it. So I would have been the guy who sold it you know, $800 worth of Apple founding shares and then been in a psychotherapy for the next, you know, 20 years. Um, I'm rooting for you guys at some level, but I'm going to watch from the cheap seats. Uh, my big fear, the one that I just can't get rid of is uh, you're going to have to, I think you're going to have to do battle with the sovereign states at some point. And that's going to be battle of the bastards. And, uh, and I, the, the, the idea that it's distributed and stuff, I don't think protects you. I, I think, uh, I think it, it, you might be able to beat them, but by no means is that, is that a lock, in my opinion. When the sovereigns decide to squash Bitcoin, if they do, now people say, oh, they can't. Now, yes, they can. They squash gold in 33, right? They, they can squash anything they want. Um, then the game is on, and then, then it's going to be beyond entertaining. And uh, I have mixed emotions, because if you guys dominate the globe, the gold loses. <laughs> so, so I think you guys are pirating my profits in gold. I think that's true. I think, I think the people who are putting money into Bitcoin would be buying gold instead. So there's a cannibalization going on. But again, what the holders also didn't hear me say in that same statement about I don't need five fold up is that I also don't need an 80% down. And so there, there's sort of mirror image. So I, I don't want the volatility of Bitcoin and I would have loved to have owned it, right? 10 bucks, 10 bucks a pop to here would have been pretty cool. But, uh, but I can live with the, the missed opportunities. What I, what I can't do is forgive myself for, for making a bad call. And so I got to go with my heart. Okay, we need to go d deeper uh, down this rabbit hole. So, you know, Eric Kaysen, he writes awesome articles on crypto sovereignty. Uh, he's uh, the, if I can introduce you, Eric, I mean, you're the director of client service at Unchained Cap. You call yourself crypto anarchist and you write you know, about the social ramifications of Bitcoin on cryptosovereignty.org. And Eric Vasquil is, uh, he's a, I don't know, he's a, he's a genius on, on a lot of other fields like um, he's written uh, the book Crypto Economics, which deals with the fundamental principles of Bitcoin. Would it be, you know, security, the complexities, uh, the flaws, and un uh, you know, the things that really need to be understood in totality? So maybe we can talk about it yourself a little bit. Explain, you know, why you've written this book. Um, let me go come back to you, David. I mean, you wrote on uh, February 14th, sovereigns are the weak. I see the Bitcoin community is taking on the entire banking system, which has the power to clamp down. Uh, what? Okay, let me let me ask you, uh, Eric uh, Vasquez or Kason, what would that? <clears throat> how would you describe you know a scenario or a worst case scenario if it should come like you know uh, to a to a battle? Uh, to you know, to paraphrase uh, Dave. 
Worst case from whose perspective? Yours. The individual. <laughs> the individual. The individual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, as the you know individual versus the state. Um, worst case. I mean, I, I, I just don't think of it in that terms. That's why I asked. But um, like I. So I, I think you know it's interesting. I David has has good insights and uh, intuitions about it. I think. Um, you know, despite not having the technical background or spent a lot of time in Bitcoin, I think um, a lot of people miss the pretty obvious things that he's picked up on. Um, Bitcoin is um, an attempt to avoid uh, what I lump all into taxation of the state, taxation of money, uh, taxation of transactions, which require transparency. Um, and so it's a it's really a two-pronged attack on those forms of taxations. Uh, one, to allow people to, in an electronic money, avoid the taxation of signage, and the other to avoid the taxation of transparency. Um, you know, seeing everything you do makes it quite a bit easier to tax it. Um, if it wasn't for the state um, uh, attack, uh, you know, taxing those two aspects of humanity, uh, Bitcoin just wouldn't be necessary. Um, so, the, the, the complexities or the, the design of it anticipates um, certain behaviors. And, you know, we don't, and it's another thing, you know, David, people point out, we haven't really seen those yet, um, the, that defense in action. Um, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the, 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 the central point of your question now. Um, it's the idea that the sovereigns at some point, now the good news would be if the sovereigns never felt at risk. And so they let you just become like a new Euro, right? Let's yeah. call it oh. a new, the crypto, just like the Euro, just like the Yuan. Just so they, if they, if they let you guys coexist, I think they'll demand transparency as you say, right? Right. Well, that's taxation is the whole ball game. They want control and they also want okay. control of money supply. So exactly. They want control. They want transparency. The state wants transparency and the state wants to be able to, when we talk about money supply, it's really metaphorical or, you know, euphemistic, really what they want is to be able to print some of their own. And right. that's what, that's what we mean. And that's what I mean when I say sign tax, right? They want to be able to tax uh, in a fairly trans, uh, in a very opaque manner. Um, which in the West, we don't, um, a lot of people just don't recognize, they refuse to recognize. And in other parts of the world, it's very, very well understood. Um, you know, I, I travel a lot and, um, you know, you talk to people in Zimbabwe, they, they know how it works, right? You talk to people, yes. you know, in Europe or in the US, they, they really just don't have any idea. So um, that's because of the, you know, the West tends to be more restrained in that level of taxation, um, usually. But uh, eventually, you know, debt piles up and, and the money needs to come from somewhere. So um, printing your own is, is a fairly opaque way to tax people. And uh, generally, the people doing it aren't the ones that are in, in power when, when the bill comes due. So it's very attractive. And that's why, you know, most um, governments tend to fail in a, in a currency crisis because it's the, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's the way they try to tax their way out of the debt. But um, I, I was just recalling, you know, the, the question was, um, what does the worst case scenario look like? Well, I, I think the anticipated scenario is how I would put it. The, the, the scenario that Bitcoin anticipates is one, four phases I, I talked about. First phase is where we are now. I call it the honeymoon phase. It's just not big enough for them to care. There's not enough loss of tax revenue, either through um, non-use of state money or um, lack of transparency. Um, you know, the vast, I would guesstimate that the vast majority of Bitcoin transactions are actually going through uh, very transparent mechanisms right now, uh, online exchanges, for example. And, you know, people are paying their capital gains tax. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not avoiding the entire, you're avoiding some of it, right? But if the dollar uh, loses half its value, you're going to pay, you know, 37% of that uh, in, uh, in capital gains tax um, if, you're, if you're following the law. And it's hard not to if you're if you're using um, any of these white market mechanisms that, that people have set up. So we're in this phase right now where it's just not big enough to care. And um, because people are using it in this way, transparency is pretty uh, pretty good. Um, but at some point, if 
the state doesn't step in and stop it, then what's to prevent people from just no longer using state money, right? Not, not really anything. And people would continue to, to use Bitcoin for more and more things. And at some point, it, it may become big enough um, for a state to actually care. I mean, this is the reason there is state money in the first place. It's a taxation mechanism. It's not a necessity um, otherwise. So at that point, you know, when David refers to clamping down, what you, what you, you know, the first move, the easiest move is just to sign a piece of paper that says you can't do this. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's a simplistic view that what you would actually see likely is what I call FedCoin, which is modifications, which mean it's no longer Bitcoin, but people can, you know, people who are happy transacting the white market actually would like to see state support or, you know, um, the state condoning this activity, um, that's, that might even lead to an increase in usage, right? Where the two things that the state would want um, in, a, in a Fed coin is the two things that they get from their money, which is signage and transparency. And that can come very trivially from a techno technological standpoint, just force everybody, you know, exchanges, merchants, basically everybody, every single person that operates legally to accept inflation transactions signed by the state um, and to only transact, um, you know, for only allow miners or exchanges or merchants to accept transactions that have been approved, which is the way the existing financial system works. Every transaction is approved by the state if it's electronic. So if they get those two things, that's not Bitcoin, right? That's a fork off of Bitcoin. Um, uh, censorship, which is the transparency aspect, can be achieved with a soft fork and, you know, uh, um, uh, a hash power enforced you know, 51% attack essentially, but that could be perfectly voluntary. Uh, we've had several 51% um, attacks on Bitcoin. They're called soft forks, right? That's, that's how we enforce them. Um, if enough of the miners, you know, who are all white market, big operations, uh, you know, the vast majority and exchanges, et cetera, accept that, then there'll be, a, you know, the vast majority of what's happening right now will be on a fork. Um, and the uh, transparency aspect, you know, can be achieved through a hard fork, of course. So that's no longer Bitcoin. So the interesting aspect of that is, well, there's still a Bitcoin, right? It's just not in the white market. If you choose to do it now, you're, you're black market. And again, this isn't, doesn't, it's not that every state would do this or has to do this. It's just that some might. And when they do, everybody else from their perspective is black market. So that's what I mean when I say white market. Black market, people obey the law, people don't in some jurisdiction, right? But that's not sufficient because people will still do it, just like any other black market activity um, that people find peaceful. They'll continue to do it, and you go. So that second phase I call um, black market phase, right? And the and the and we're 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 always edging towards that. These are not bright lines. Um, but for example, Nigeria, Bitcoin's black market, all of it. Uh, Vietnam, um, you can own it and trade it on exchanges, but you can't accept it as a merchant. Um, you can't, can't actually accept payments in Bitcoin. So I held a conference there in Vietnam and I was very careful to make sure that my website wasn't taking Bitcoin and, and that I wasn't taking it from anybody who actually lived there. But, um, you know, that, that level of black marketness can obviously change and, and that's um, very easy to do. And people who argue that it's a, um, it can't be done because Bitcoin's popular, well, they're, they're just making a political argument, right? If, 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 if good money was popular, we would have it, right? <laughs> People would vote for it. Um, Bitcoin is not a de democracy. It's not a, a political money. Um, it would assume that people aren't going to do that, and that's why we have it. So you go into the third phase, which is um, it's not working. There's too much black market activity, which is a very common scenario. And at that point, there has to be physical action, right, a apart from just arresting people who, you know, exchange operators that, that don't want to comply. You have to go after the black marketeers and, and the easiest, Bitcoin is unique in many ways. And one of the ways is that the easiest way to do that is from one point on the earth. You don't have to send, you know, troops to the, to the jungles. You just set up a big mine and start mining. So the, the next logical course of action um, in that case would be for the state to compete in the competition phase uh, for 51%. And Again, mining is profitable and being the biggest miner is the most profitable. So they can do that without actually losing any money. And um, if people start, you know, leaving Bitcoin or not using it anymore, well, that's the objective. So there's really, you know, not a lot of downside there. Um, but at that point, what happens is 
you, you, there's, a, there's a fourth phase, which is somebody surrenders, right? The, if you're executing a 51% attack successfully or unsuccessfully, it can't last too long because one of those sides is losing everything. All the money they're putting into mining is a total loss. Um, at which point, there's no reason to do it anymore, right? Um, either there's no reason to be a black market Bitcoiner or there's no reason to be the state because one side's not working and it falls back into one of these other phases. And I could see it cycling through these phases. I mean, it will cycle through these phases. Um, just the question is, you know, which ones? Um, and that's, you know, how do you describe a worst case in that scenario? I don't know what's, maybe the worst case is 51% attack is, is successful. You know, uh, nobody's able to transact um, in Bitcoin and they start up some other coin and they try it again and, you know, it happens again. It's similar, you know, transition through phases. The thing that the, the facility that Bitcoin provides to defend against this is not what most people assume. And it took me about a year of thinking on this to actually figure it out. And I've, I've worked in core Bitcoin development for you know, six, going on seven years now, and, and I couldn't find anything in the code that prevented the state from passing a law or executing 51% attack. Um, but I felt there had to be, if there's gonna be censorship resistance, there had to be a mechanism um, that, the, that the code provides to allow um, people to um, continue to operate in the face of these threats. And the answer to that question is, is fees. Um, if, you're, if your censored transactions are not getting mined, um, or if your transactions are not getting mined today, you raise your fees until they get mined. And when the state is, when the 51% um, attacker is not taking those because they're censored, um, the, other, the fees on other transactions are lower. And so their profit margin, uh, well, they're, they're, they're op the opportunity to mine the censored transactions at a higher profit continues to rise. And that can provide incentive for illegal miners to actually take the risk to mine them. That can, that can potentially raise hash power to the point where the state now has to tax. At, at any point where that's successful, the state has to tax to subsidize its mining. It's not mining at a loss. In other words, its energy cost is higher than its, uh, than its taken fees. So the differential between fees in the black market censored transactions and fees in the white market is what provides for censorship resistance in Bitcoin, which I don't think Satoshi even ever recognized. Um, people just felt like the community would band together and donate to this, you know, counteroffensive, <laughs> which is economically irrational and it defeats the purpose of Bitcoin, right? The people who are going to pay for it are the people who want their transactions mined. So you can't prove who's going to want to pay more, the taxpayers or the, uh, or the market, um, which is why uh, this remains an open question and, and probably will forever. So that's my take on, you know, I, I can't describe that as worst case scenario. I describe that as, as what the system is designed to defend against and to do. When is it big enough? You, you're saying, you just said a number of times, uh, you know, when it gets big enough, what, what is, what are we talking about? Like what kind of volume or, or something? Well, really value is subjective, right? So we don't know how valuable it is to any given person, taxpayer, you know, legislator, government. We don't know how, how at what point does it become valuable enough for them, you know, but, or costly enough for them in, in terms of tax revenue uh, loss to actually do something about it. But you can see this and somebody posted something uh, not too long ago um, showing adoption by country um, of Bitcoin. And I thought it was interesting because the countries that had the highest percentage of adoption had the, you know, it wasn't a perfect correlation, but certainly had the, had high percentages of restriction. Nigeria was the number one in terms of percentage adoption and they are completely banned. Um, Vietnam was number two and it is probably the second most um, restricted uh, country in terms of Bitcoin. Um, you know, the US and Europe in terms of percentage were, were pretty low and they have pretty low levels of control relative to those. So obviously in those countries or presumably in those countries, um, it's worth it now for the state to actually step in and do something um, because they see the, the, the kind of um, progressive loss of value in their tax system. They see it coming. So that nicely dovetails in with the idea, you know, people talk about inflation versus hyperinflation and we've never had hyperinflation, although we might've been working towards it, I don't know, but- um, Revolutionary you know, War, <laughs> Civil War. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, we had Not some- that hyperinflation. <laughs> we had some bad inflation there. One of the, uh, 
the definitions of hyperinflation is failed state. And you just described failed states. So in some sense where Bitcoin is, has taken over, those, that's because they were failed states. Now, I think the optimists, the non-Bitcoin non, non fans, uh, optimists, um, are assuming that the U.S. and the West could never become a failed state. And that that's where I would disagree. So I that's why I get Bitcoin. I I, I believe that we're, we're marching towards an increasingly increasingly high probability of, of becoming a failed state. And and that's when Bitcoin wins, potentially real estate wins, gold wins. So so the, the people who somehow have the uh, governmentless governmentless control now um, even um, even real estate, you say, well, the government can take your land. Um, I used to have long discussions with this guy named Tony Deaton, and he says, yeah, you hang on to your, your, your deed. And when that government fails, you go back and you get your land back. And so you get multi-generational wealth transfer. I think there's Cubans who will go back to Cuba and claim their land back at some point. And, uh, and so I think that's the win for Bitcoin you just described, when the, fa when the state fails. And, and uh, as long as the state has power, that's when they're going to be fighting. Maybe that's your phase three. They haven't yet failed. Phase four sounds like the failure. Yeah, so you right? know what? You know what follows a failed state, right? Suck. <laughs> yeah, a, new, yeah. a, new, a new state. That's right. Run on Bitcoin is what. It's still a, it's the same government in Germany is still in power that that survived all through before and after World War II and. You know, there's still there's still government in Rome. Um, you know, they so, said that, that Zimbabwe was on the gold standard. They were the only country you'd go down and do pan for gold and go buy a loaf of bread with it because they had they're on allowed. they're on the dollar dollar euro rand standard. Yeah, they're on anything but Zimbabwe dollars. Yeah. Eric, Case, uh, what's your take on that? Uh, I think those are pretty astute and accurate portrayals. You know, like I I think that's sort of run of the course. Um, you know, I don't think that's worst case scenario. I, I think worst case scenario is the state really flips out and, you know, like, let's say a large scale terrorist attack or some sort of financing is done utilizing Bitcoin. I could see the state freaking out, making it illegal, 6102ing the exchanges, uh, giving everybody the equivalent value of Fed coin, uh, and doing really high profile attacks against vocalize bitcoiners to really try to scare people away from it right um you know i do also i'm really curious how the contentiousness inside of the state's going to play out because it's pretty clear that here in the united states that uh states like uh wyoming for example is already having pretty strong legislation towards bitcoin and encouraging it and I wouldn't be shocked if we could see a Soviet style dissolution where states really assert their sovereignty against the federal government and go, there is nowhere in the United States constitution that stipulates that the federal reserve needs to be our money and we don't need to play this game. Uh, you know, and I think stuff can get pretty wild at that point in time because uh, I can't imagine the United States federal government is going to allow its power to be challenged in such a way, particularly by, you know, states that they had a whole civil war over this idea of sovereignty and what it means. Um, and furthermore, like, I, I don't think the state is necessarily paying attention at this point in time. It's just too small, as, as both of these gentlemen have pointed out. And so I think as this accelerates, because it clearly is, um, I do have really strong concerns about, you know, what if they choose to go after someone like Elon Musk? What if, what if they start making individual examples? Uh, and as much as I want to believe that we'll courageously stand up and fight the fight, I'm just not sure if we really have that in us. So I think that it's going to be a pretty interesting cat and mouse game between the states and individuals for how this is going to play out. And ultimately, I do think that there's going to be, you know, whether they're small Caribbean island nations or, or others, there's going to be certain states that come out with very positive policies for both taxation and migration. Uh, and I think that'll encourage a large number of Bitcoiners to actually go there, um, particularly when, you know, we have pretty strong property rights here in the United States. But I have to imagine that in places like Venezuela, that like active and large Bitcoin holders will be actively hunted by the state. And in places like China, they'll just disappear. 
And so I think that this is all part of a, a pretty dark future that comes after this honeymoon phase when it becomes clear that this isn't going away. It's a real thorn in the side of the state. They're losing large tax revenue because of it. Uh, you know, and, and we got some real, some, some real wild folks out here. So like, I, I'm not even beyond seeing collectives of Bitcoiners popping up that are like very well armed and that the state is like, look like this, this for all intents and purposes looks like an active militia that like we need to figure out how to deal with. Uh, and I think that's when like pretty scary stuff's going to start to go down. Um, and I'm no, not Eric, surprised like my vision's a little darker than your guys's, but that's sort of where I see it going. No, actually, you just described you just described my end game. And 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 if you look at you know the post Capitol Hill event, they're putting all sorts of crazy stuff into gear. So they're already showing the things. And mm -hmm. and you know, I saw a bill that went through and and they. Uh, they were talking about hunting down, you know, domestic terrorists, but they kept referring to them as white supremacists. I go, well, when do you put a bill through Congress with the word white or black or, or American Indian or whatever in the bill that's not, that's antagonistic, right? That's a pretty surreal bill to talk about white supremacists. And they could I'll have used my... they, they, but they, but it, so I, I'm terrified at the post capital well, I'll call it a riot. I, I absolutely refuse to call it an insurrection, which is ridiculous. But now I, I think that we have never been closer to an authoritarian state. I, 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 I'm getting emails from the heads from Andrew saying, I'm getting the second passport. I'm getting ready. I'm getting out of here if I have to. I have a different view. Where do you live, um, Eric? Wong? California. Yeah, my my um, my bug out plan, the, the ultra rich have, you know, one phone call, run to the airport, get on the jet, go offshore. And there's a lot of big money guys who have that, I'm assured. Um, my bug out plan is get in the car, go to Wyoming right? and, 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 and get a hotel, buy a cabin on a lake and make sure that there's low density of people and they're all gun toting um, crazies. Right. And and. Mm -hmm. Dave, do you think I it's don't the, think they'll get up there easily? Wyoming could secede. So I mean, could that be a problem? <laughs> I'm not talking secede. I'm just saying that it's going to be so out in the middle of nowhere that it's not going to be a battleground. So you go someplace where, you know, so you say, well, isn't Ithaca that? Ithaca seems like a <laughs> no, actually, because Ithaca is kind of this biosphere of liberalism. Hmm. And I've told many colleagues, I said, look, if Ithaca ever goes violent, you know, if Antifa decides to show up in Ithaca for some reason. There's two people in this town or at the top of the list that they can go after and one of them's me. And, 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 and so people say, oh, you're over planet. I go, all I need is for a violent, violent left-wing um, uprising in Ithaca and, and I'm on the list. I'm right there at the, the pinnacle of the list. We'll be getting canceled. I've already been canceled. There, I'll be getting canceled. After I got canceled in June, I slept with a shotgun, loaded shotgun for a number of months. Wow. And, and it's not like this. This is where I expect us to go at this point in time. That's and I was right. talking to my wife about this last night is that uh, look like I know I know racist people like it, they, that's their belief system that it, it's a deplorable idea. Uh, are they white supremacists? No, like, no, they don't have any logical idea of making like a white nation of, of Christianity. But the fact that uh, like this stuff is being ate up and that it's being regurgitated, I find really scary. Uh, like sure. there's that New York Times article recently about like, don't think critically. Like, wow, like that's, that's, a, that's a real far fall that uh, really scares me, you know? And I expect us to go in that direction. In addition to, you know, Biden seems to have some pretty outlandish ideas for how he wants to clamp down the second amendment. Uh, and there's and a, so there's I, a, there's a dominance of uh, narrative shaping, right? I never, it was probably all, always there, but now it's so garish where, whether it's about the importance of masking, sheltering, climate change, you name it, there's this, um, there's this state sponsored narrative. And when you break from it, you get, you get booted off social media, you get your ass kicked, Visa won't process your MasterCard payments. Or, you know, I, there's just, it's happening now. It's not something that could happen. It's happening now. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm really fascinated with that much because it's really showing me how pliable the American mindset is. And it really scares me because 
uh, like these are super dangerous stuff where uh, there was a great article I read recently that, that uh, I think it was wrote by, can't recall, but it was talking about this exact problem and how uh, one of the pastors who worked with Martin Luther King in the deep South, like he refused to reject the, the racists that were part of his community. And he was like, look, it's, it's very problematic that we want to dehumanize these individuals because we disagree with them. And that's what I'm seeing going on now is that if you frankly say anything that's misappropriate or that somebody perceives as being offensive, they seem to believe that that's a right to try to destroy your life. Um, and I expect much, much more of that. And explicitly with Bitcoin, when we start to see uh, inflationary events starting to come out, I very much accept, I, I very much believe that the entire apparatus is going to be Bitcoin is destroying the financial system. This is these guys' fault. They engineered this destruction. This is financial terrorism. We need to take these guys out with our drone machines now, or else they're going to create a radical, violent militia. And we need to, and, and essentially the state's going to be like, we need to kill and abduct them immediately and preempt all of this because they're very rich. They're very powerful. They're clearly armed. And they have been talking about this kind of an event for a long time. So if they want to fight, let's fight. Um, yeah, and my plan is, is I live close to the, the coast. I know the coastline very well. Uh, I'm an experienced diver and boater, and I have a plan to get out. Get, and, get, a, you know, get a Zodiac and, and, and some scuba I, gear. <laughs> I do have my Zodiac, my scuba gear, my extra gasoline. I, awesome. Uh, you know, our underwater, uh, I haven't used them yet, but my dad found some of those oh. underwater uh, driving machines. And, and a spear gun for fishing, yeah. Done that. Yeah. Um, I used to live in Laguna Beach. I had all that. <laughs> well, exactly. I did all that. So, and and on, on to that importance, like, I think if you're, like, if you own several Bitcoin, you should have a very serious conversation with your family, figuring out what is your GTFO plan. Because I expect that there will be a day that all this stuff goes down. And there's this really scary moment where we have to go, oh, shit, it's time to get the fuck out of Dodge. Because, you know, whether it's anti fuzz at your house or the police are there to question you or the FBI for whatever reason, you really should, you know, have a plan to get out. And like, that's fucking scary. I know, I'm sorry, it sucks, but we're in a crazy time, you know? We're printing out money at, at a very extreme rate. Uh, the highest levels of government have bought into all of this bullshit. Uh, you know, and, and to me, Biden was the worst possible choice for a president just because he he pretends that he's liberal, but he just represents the oligarchic establishment uh, very, very well, you know, and I expect for us to at least engage in a dozen new wars within the next 12 months. Uh, and, and that's kind of my summary. So while we're in the honeymoon phase, like, uh, you know, remember the honeymoon phase lasts about a month and then you're going to start talking about getting rid of your motorcycles and other things. <laughs> nice. Which you oh have. Ready to bring it full circle, huh? Right. Hey, Eric, I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, make, uh, a while back you made a comment on uh, Elon Musk and, you know, uh, making an example of somebody and, and what can happen. Um, and I wanted to, 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 to bring in a, a not too distant historical observation in the, in the, in the crypto universe. Um, we can probably all remember the time way back when the big craze was uh, tokenization of securities, mm. right? I mean, that was a thing. That was a, for about a year or two. That was all anybody ever talked about. And I'm like, you know, this is this is this can be interesting to watch go away very quickly. And it's completely gone now. And um, so we're not talking about the Fed. We're talking about the SEC, right? And so setting aside all the all the all the implementation and design, you know, deficiencies of some of these things, the idea of putting securities, you know, into blockchainy stuff was simply a way to circumvent the SEC uh, um, restrictions laws of 33 and 34, which um, heavily restrict what people can trade for securities. Um, we just don't call them securities. We, we trade them the way we trade Bitcoin and nobody will care, you know, and this is gonna be a brave new world of, of, of open investment, et cetera. And you, you know, you just project that forward to, well, if, if they allow that, then there is no more restriction. Right, it, it just goes away. Everything moves into these tokenized securities, and the SEC just sits back idly and does nothing. Right, and I said, well, that's that's not going to last. And it started started growing and growing, and then sure enough, they did uh, one or two perp walks. Um, you know, actually, I think they took took at least one guy out in handcuffs. You know, for one of these companies that was doing this, 
And that was it. It was over, right. completely gone. And that's the effect um, that a simple stroke of the pen or it, active enforcement of, of laws that already exist can have on the white market. Now, there's nothing to prevent people from doing that same thing in the black market, but do you see it? Not, not really, not too much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you'd have to have a company that operates in the black market to securitize it that way and do it in the black market, right? With, with Bitcoin as being a money, yeah, there's, are, there's already a lot of companies that operate in the black market that could use a good money. So it's a little bit different uh, game. Um, but it, it's, a, it's an example of how chilling the, um, the effect of just a simple example, uh, setting an example of somebody who runs a company. I mean, you know, if they said you have to take FedCoin, they go into the office of uh, the CEO of Coinbase. So you have a choice. We'll take you out in handcuffs or you'll take our FedCoin or you'll close your business. What's it going to be, right? And then what's every other exchange going to do? Right? It, it's, it, they'll be gone. It'll simply be gone. It's just a stroke of the pen. So um, it, I, when, you were, when you were mentioning that, it just occurred to me that there was a pretty uh, shining example of that already having happened in this community. Well, yeah. the other thing you could, I, 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 this may get us into deep trouble, but I, I'm still a, a firm believer in election fraud, right? That's, that's essentially like admitting you're a pedophile, but I'm a believer in the election fraud. To the, to the extent I'm correct, it, it shows you the magnitude that the system can, can get into trouble and, and do nefarious things and, and simply do it in plain sight and, and not, not get pushback, right? They just make sure... The, the, the biggest problem we have in the United States now compared to our past is we have no media. We, we have zero media, right? Our, our only hope are bloggers who are dredging and fishing and trying not to get their videos knocked off of social media and stuff like that. But the mainstream media is, is telling us precisely what someone out there is telling them to say. And, and well, why do you why do you watch it? I mean, I haven't well, watched I don't. Media I don't. The problem is ninety five percent of the people do, and sure. that's oh, it's not that we don't have options. That's the compliance of the American people. No, but it takes a huge amount of work to keep up with the events um, while they're playing out. You say, okay, here's the deal. I don't think this story is correct. Like I, I wrote about uh, George Floyd killing, and I think it is truly unambiguous that he was not suffocated by the cop. I, you, I, I think it will be impossible to build a case against uh, Chauvin court. And, and I'll make a very long story short. Seven times before he was on the ground, he said, I can't breathe. Seven times before he was on the ground, he said, he was having a heart attack. He was already dying. No mainstream media touched that. No mainstream media touched that. Yeah, but and, you found it. What's that? You found it, so it's out there. I mean, yeah, if you want to you get, get your news, just follow Eric. <laughs> I'm, we're, we're bloggers, though. So this is the black market of information. And so, and it's not getting to many people because I bet you, you guys are as bad as me. I spend truly appalling amounts of time trying to sort this stuff out. Mm -hmm. The average person's trying to figure out how to get food on the table and how to get the kids to school. And, and so there's the black market of the, of the information flow, which the state totally sends deeply, deeply under the surface. And then you've got, I've never had a discussion with serious, you know, uh, Bitcoiners who had, I would say this clarity of concern, right? You guys, you guys like it and see the problem. And that, that to me is healthy. And so you understand who you're fighting. I mean, smoking all the hopiums, like great fun and all, but like, it, it's pretty dumb at the end of the day to, to be like, yeah, like this, we'll like invent this new money and like the state will be like, right on guys. Like you guys exactly. sure taught us the bad thing. You know, like it's just not gonna play out that way. Um, and with the coronavirus is premiere, like the, this was the first time that I truly had an event where I was looking through the news and I was like, I actually don't know what the fuck is true anymore. Mm -hmm. That's like, exactly right. Exactly. And, it was, and it was hard to admit that to myself because like there's been plenty of places like that where that's happened to me. But with this, I was, at first I was like, I have no fucking clue. I was like, I, I, I can't tell if it is the deadly pandemic that's going to destroy the world or if it's, you know, a little bit more than a cold that's going to make people upset. But I do know that, like, the, the state's dialogue captured people hook, line, and sinker. And it really scares me that, uh, you know, I will be outside on a windy day 10 feet away from people and they are freaking out to get their mask on. And that, like, that requires a special kind of authoritarian design. 
Um, and like, I don't want to take away from, you know, it, it's deadly. Some people get more infected than others, but there really seems to be this lack of first principles for individuals on a whole. Um, and I think like, if we're talking about the black market of information, like that's really what Bitcoin is like all the way down about like monetary policy and being like, hey, check it out. Like, check out this alternative thing. Why should I care about that? Well, look at what money supply is. And I think that's what orange pilling is, is essentially opening people up to this different idea of what it means to have this alternative that isn't over the purview of the state. And what does it mean to challenge them? And what does it mean to say no to that? Uh, and that's going to be a very radically different thing in the age of today, you know, because like if we had all of this come out, say, uh, in 2000, I do think there would be a standing chance that like the state could integrate it and play nice with it. Because we're so far down this authoritarian pathway, I don't think that that's even an option on the table anymore. Uh, and I think part of it is, is because there's been this dramatic capturing of the state knows best for everybody. The state can label people as the enemy that it just doesn't like. And yeah, I expect within the next two years for the word financial terrorism to be used much more actively around Bitcoin, crypto in general. And yeah, that's when that's when stuff will get very interesting. And I expect, you know, for uh, esteemed individuals that we know in the community to uh, I wouldn't necessarily say vanish, but I do definitely expect them to be silenced because of the various sort of uh, legal decrees that will be put upon them. And if you guys aren't familiar with my work, like I deal a lot with this idea of the sovereign exception and how in uh, these cases of the state can create a state of emergency, how essentially it allows itself to step outside and beyond the law in ways that it unilaterally wants to. I'd challenge the assertion that this is this would only you know the state might have played happy in the past, but now it's now things are are different. I mean, you just look at Liberty Reserve. I mean, the the precursor, you know, that was 2013 when it was taken down. But they the guys that ran that had a precursor called Gold Age from 2002 ish, right? And they they were they were sentenced to you know what years in prison, five years. I'm just looking it up. Yeah, we reduced sentence to five years in prison for running Gold Age in, in 2002, 2006, when they did that, right? The Illegal Iron financial. Bond oh. Nuthouse, right? Remember the guy who made the silver coins? Right. So, I mean, the, 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 the desire to preserve the value in state money goes back forever, basically. I mean, currency controls have existed for a long time. It's just, um, you know, nothing is, they've never let it, nothing's, but ever, it's not that, that state has never let anything get big enough. Um, it's that there hasn't been anything that has had the ability to um, do what Bitcoin does at such a large scale to evade the simple and easy state controls like marching down to Costa Rica and arresting these guys, right? Now it's harder, so it takes more effort. So it's gotta be worth more to go and do it. You know, if they could have just arrested Satoshi, they would have done it by now. But, you know, um, so I, I don't really think it's, the political environment that drives, you know, anything different in this situation. The difference is that Bitcoin is different than anything that's existed before, in my opinion, and that's why it's gotten so much further than anything before. Um, so the value proposition uh, for the state is, is different, right? It's, it's, a, it's a much greater effort that has to be expended, which is why Bitcoin, right? It, it makes it more expensive to attack. It's not that it's unattackable. It's just, you know, you just can't march into one person's office and close it down. That's been done many, many times. And of course, I think David early on mentioned gold. I mean, they did it with gold. Right. And that was, again, a situation that required um, quite a bit of uh, opportunity cost to become worth it. You know, we're talking about the Great Depression and World War II pending, right, with a lot of money being printed and the, the, the refuge of gold, um, was very attractive and so they had to do something um so the obvious so it was it was worth it at that point and my theory on the reason that gold became legal again at least to transact and it's you know it still it still suffers from capital gains tax like bitcoin but at some point most transactions became electronic and so as that was happening it just it wasn't as important anymore so they said yeah fine do what you want with your gold um and so there's this gap until something comes along that's electronic and is like gold, it can't be shut down by walking into somebody's office. And so now, um, you know, you're looking at a similar, similar proposition where it's got to become worth it. 
uh, to do. And I think more than, more than the, you know, whatever is going on politically in the United States or around the world with all this other stuff, right? I think it's just simply the value proposition isn't there yet. Um, in the state. Well, also more... superimposed upon this is they also had, they, in the past, they could control the narrative easily. And now they're having trouble because of the digital world. And I think the two are feeding on each other because, um, because they're, they're kind of breaking out the knives to deal with the, the rapid flow of information too. And, and, and so the, the, the degree of censorship, you would have never believed 10 years ago. You would have never believed the sort of the magnitude, how much they'd step on ideas. And, and that you'd be, you'd be clamped down because you, 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 you argued that the vaccine wasn't healthy or you got clamped down because you argued that, uh, uh, that the Capitol building wasn't uh, attacked. These ideas, at one point, we would have said were, were guaranteed under the Constitution, and now they're just stepping on us like there's no tomorrow. I, I, there's stuff I can't post on Twitter because I think I'll lose my Twitter feed if I do. That, yeah, that's a fundamental, will. that's a staggering problem. I, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my Twitter feed if I, if I follow you. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably will. Um, I'm sending out my my cell phone to to to, to close confidants, thinking at some point I'm going to get cut off. So at least we will we will reconnect in some other way. I mean, it's fun that there's the the censorship resistant properties of Bitcoin that while we haven't utilized these for you know uh, events where people get canceled, I, I'm excited about some of the responses that it'll be able to create. And to me, actually, like this is part of the larger whole ecosystem thing that's going on is that the core cryptography like in Bitcoin is now out deployed and people are playing with it a lot more and building stuff on top of it and using decentralized applications. And I'm really excited for that because another thing we haven't discussed in this conversation that I, I'm, I'm curious about is, is that if Bitcoin goes at, or if the state goes after Bitcoin, there's these 10,000 other shitcoin projects that they have to go after too. And inherently, while a lot of them don't have nearly the, as powerful of a network effect or the cryptography that Bitcoin does, like there still is a good affect there that, um, you know, I can imagine them going after some of the top 10 projects, but there's still these 9,000 other ones. And so like, I don't, I don't know how you can go after this without it becoming a massive game of whack-a-mole across the board. Well, you know, it, 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 um, it's really not any different than the scenario described where Bitcoin gets pushed into the black market and maybe it's much smaller, right? Like a lot of these alternative coins, right? It's, this, it's the same thing, um, the same basic problem. And, you know, even if that for some reason doesn't work, you just start up a new one, right? <laughs> start, start up a new one with a different Genesis block and a one bit change to the mining algorithm. And now you got a new coin. It's still the same Bitcoin. It still has the same code, you know, the sa same idea. It's just a different, a different chain, a different history. Um, and it has to build up from something smaller, but it, it did it before, you know, um, so there, there's no, that's one of the interesting things about Bitcoin, it, you know, it, the network is the network and that, that's, the, that's what pro pro provides the value, but that can be recreated and any number of coins that are essentially identical to Bitcoin can be created over time just by flipping a couple bits in the, in the code base and, you know, firing it up. So um, it's interesting from a, um, you know, that's the, that's the, the old argument about the defense against a, you know, a 51% attack by the state is we'll just, we'll just hard fork ourselves off, which is, you know, an altcoin that, you know, that is slightly different. And so they have to make new mining equipment. Um, I, I've argued against that as a rational defense, because, you know, every time you fork your coin, you, you split the economy, which is the size of your network. And the miners that come to your new network are not necessarily the ones you want. Right? They're the ones that are the biggest miners. I remember I had this conversation with one of the largest miners in the world. I was on a panel um, and I asked him, I think it was beforehand, I asked him, so what would you do if, you know, if there was a, you know, a proof of work hard fork and, and uh, you have all this mining equipment, you know, you're one of the biggest miners in the world, you, you start for this huge loss and he said, oh, we just, we just fire up again on the new chain. And because they have capital, right? Bigger miners are more profitable. They're the ones with the excess capital to retool and they can raise capital. The smaller ones, the ones that you want to keep that aren't censoring, you know, <laughs> they're the ones you're putting out of business. So you keep factoring your economy into smaller pieces and you keep putting, putting out of business the miners you want. Um, so really changing coins, you know, to dodge 
this this attack um, is a counterproductive approach. There has to be a there has to be an economically rational defense, and I I believe that is you know the, the fee pre premium, which is what will 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 pay for defense against the state. Um, but the other the other aspect of the uh, of Bitcoin being this thing that can be recreated ad infinitum is uh, is essential to understanding supply, right? You can't create another gold. You can switch to silver, you know, you can't, but you can't create almost, you know, identical copies of these things. Um, Bitcoin, you can create as many as you want. And it, it's, it's my theory that, well, it, it's already in practice that, you know, as, as transacting on the, you know, as, as there's more use on the chain, because there's, um, you know, it has these properties that people want. So more use implies more transactions. More use is what implies more VAT, more pri higher price ultimately. But what, as you get more use, the amount of, the number of transactions or the size of transactions you can do goes up, right? You can't do any, you can't, you know, if it's five, 10 bucks transaction, anything under a hundred bucks isn't happening. Um, you know, to, you, you invest and then you liquidate, you, you, if it's 10% of the, if, you're, if your fee is 10% of what you've in, invested in some, something to do with Bitcoin, you've lost two years of gains at, at 10% per year. So, you know, you're, you, you wipe out all these smaller transactions, but what happens? They get picked up by Litecoin or, you know, some other smaller chain that has a lower level of security, which by the way is appropriate for smaller transactions. So as I, 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 you can see it already happening, um, but Bitcoin's really just not, hasn't been there yet. But as the, as the price to transact rises, because there's a fixed transaction rate, you end up with an opportunity for other chains, and maybe in one exactly the same as Bitcoin, minus a couple bits, um, to pop up and pick up the smaller transactions. And you can imagine, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, BTC one through 10, picking up different size transactions with atomic swaps across these chains. So what does that mean? That means supply is not limited. So, right. so you just made, I think, a compelling argument that's, that's the ultimately bullish argument for crypto winning. I think you simultaneously make the same compelling argument that Bitcoin itself is a great risk. So I've always thought that the, the, the Bitcoin's biggest competitor besides the state would be other coins. It's like being a car dealer in 1920, in the 20s when there were 250 of them, right? You, hard to figure out which one of those is going to win. So to the extent that, to the to the extent that um, that 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 the system keeps shifting, what it means therefore is that these miners. It was a great description of how you said the, the big miners if they get wiped out, they can just go mine more because they've got that's this is a classic rich getting richer argument, which as a right winger I hesitate to even say, but um, but but it also means that in these transitions, the little guys, the guys who bought Bitcoin at thirty five thousand or 50,000, whatever the magic number is today, was about 57 or eight. Um, they're gonna get wiped out in these transitions because in the, the miners will just go mine the new coin, but the little guy's gonna buy at 57 and then, and then it's follow it all the way down. So I think the case was made that, that crypto can't be squashed, crypto can't be squashed, but that Bitcoin itself could be just a, 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 a thin, small chapter in the story. And the years back, they all remember when we used to use Betamax to, to, to watch videos, right? And or eight-track tapes to listen to music. Um, it seems to me that that 10 or 20 years from now, Bitcoin, the odds of Bitcoin being the dominant currency seems low to me. Well, and therefore, the low-level hodlers who are wildly enthusiastic right now do not see the risk. And that's, that's all I've ever asserted in, in that sense. Well, I, I, I never have told anybody that Bitcoin is an investment. It's a money, it's a medium of exchange, right? And no money is an investment. So it's, it's, you know, right. Best case, zero return. Guys who tell me gold's money don't make sense though either, because if I go to buy bread in a week and it's $10, it's 10% more expensive, that's not money. Money needs to be steady, right? needs to have like a frequency where I know that the price of bread next tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month is predictable. A year from now, two years from now, it's going to drift, but it's not going to be this high frequency oscillation. So value, value subjective. So 
Prices are always volatile. <laughs> if gold buys 10% fewer groceries and gold's not steady enough to be to be the, a real money, a real the point is, I make a distinction between this idea of volatility and the idea idea of stability. They're not opposites, right? They're different. Not at all. Concepts. Not at all. Right? And, and somebody with an engineering background would, would, would get that right away, right? The engineering definition of stability is the tendency to return to the norm, right. whereas volatility is standard deviation from the norm. And you can have both. And um, so you can have a money that's stable. Um, like gold is stable over time. It, it, it tends to purchase about the same as it has always, right? It doesn't appreciate in value in purchasing power. Uh, but it ex but it exhibits volatility, sometimes extreme volatility. But the um, volatility makes it not a good currency for daily use. Well, you know, good is good is relative, right? I don't no, I don't make it's not judgment. relative if my grocery bill goes up ten percent. Well, then you don't use gold for your groceries. You use something no, else. No, no, that's but, right. That's right. But <laughs> and you're 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 right that it's not it's not a medium of exchange and widespread use. It has been in the past, and so gold, the metal, is a good currency. The question is. Is it in use? Well, it's just not in use, right? right. Um, and so those are those are also different issues, I think. And you know, Bit when I say Bitcoin, um, I'm very explicit about this. You know, when I, when I write and speak about it, I'm not talking about BTC. Right. I'm talking about the concepts that Satoshi laid out in his white paper, uh, which predated the code, right? It was, this was an idea. And there are some, we, you know, we all tend to call them shit coins. I make a distinction. You know, shit coins are you know, what I consider things that purport to have the value proposition of Bitcoin, but don't. So they're, you know, they're misleading or fraudulent. Whereas if there's altcoins or split coins, you know, uh, that are essentially the same value proposition, but they're just smaller. And maybe they've tweaked some of the properties, but still have every one of the essential characteristics of Bitcoin. So um, one example is any, anything that is a proof of stake coin is not a Bitcoin. It doesn't, it doesn't have the same principles, right? It's not based on energy sinking. It's based on ownership. And it's, it's entirely not censorship resistant because once you get majority control, you own it forever. You can't be pushed out. So um, the, the possibility of other coins, you know, to me, is not a failure of Bitcoin or marginalization of Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be very successful as, and again, I have this mental image of BTC1 through N, which are handling different sizes of transactions with different levels of security. Um, and that's Bitcoin succeeding, right? It's only the people, in my opinion, who think of, this is why I started off with Bitcoin's not an investment. It's only the people who see Bitcoin as, a, as, a, as an investment, which I would call a speculation, that want to see the price of BTC rise, who reject this idea of, of other chains carrying um, different aspects of the value. And software can paper over this distinction, right? You know, BTC one through N can be one app, which atomic swaps between them. So you want to take some money out of your vault and put it in your, in your mobile wallet, right? You do, because you desire different levels of security and you want different levels of cost for transacting at those different levels of security. Doesn't take me anything. Doesn't cost me anything to pull a dollar out of my wallet, but I have, you know, I have to pay something to get it out of the bank, um, or to get it out of, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a hole in the ground. So there's different levels of security required and different level of costs that are worth those levels of security, and those can all be Bitcoin, and they can all be handled in a, um, you know, an atomic way, and it's a, a secure way uh, from a software standpoint. Um, so that I see as Bitcoin succeeding, whereas when you get into this hyper maximalist kind of mentality of there's one true coin, um, you fail to see that as an opportunity. You see that as a threat. Um, and I don't. I mean, I, I really like Hayek's approach that he took in the denationalization of money. For, for me, I read that back in 2012. And for me, like that was my real aha moment was I, I want to see free currency competition across the board and to see the most successful one compete. And, uh, w you know, being a non-state money, there are certain things that Bitcoin does that I think are really, really important that, you know, I just fundamentally don't see how the state ever actually addresses it. You know, like the, these black market transactions where people want to go buy recreational drugs or maybe even cancer drugs or something like that, uh, even though it's titled quote unquote, a black market, it, these are still places where people desire to do exchange. And I don't see that 
being problematic in conjunction with like, a, I think that we have to recognize the very real uh, economic and subjective value that is derived from being able to do that. You know, like there, there are a number of people out there that utilize Bitcoin because they could, you know, buy marijuana when they live in Iowa or something like that. And I think that, that that's an important feature for a currency that um, so long as people are able to do that with something like Bitcoin, it'll continue to present this extra value that yeah. will need to be addressed. Um, and, and also ultimately, like, I think, I really think that this is kind of the way that the state is actually going to come to the table on a lot of this stuff. Like, I, I think as much as they might want to crush this, I do think that there's enough individuals inside the establishment that will pump the brakes and say, look, I know you guys just want to stomp on this, but there are a lot of problems with that. Like, why don't we take a more tempered approach to it and try to see if there's some way that we can play nice with each other. And I think we're already along that lines. I'm just really worried that, uh, you know, essentially a bad event comes along and the state will flip out and not really think about this stuff logically. Those, those bad events are opportunities. I don't see it as the state flipping out. I see it as a, a bill that's sitting there waiting for years sometimes until the opportunity comes along to get it passed. And that's been the case with all the major events, and, you know, th that I can remember going back decades where there's well, all of a exactly sudden what happened with the insurrection, right? Didn't they pass like a 20,000 page bill like the day after or something? Yeah. Yeah. These, these bills are like in, you know, in, in the history of the crypto wars, NSA has wanted a long list of things, wasn't able to get them in the nineties. You know, we got V chips and stuff like that. And we got, you know, what is it? ITAR restrictions, but weren't able to get the deep comp comprehensive kind of surveillance state stuff that they wanted. And then after 9-11, boom, it's done. The bill was already there. It was, you know, or take Obamacare. It's not like, you know, there was some healthcare, you know, uh, crisis and they thought up some stuff, right? This bill was sitting there for a long time until the opportunity came along. And then where did this, you know, 20,000 pages come from? Um, so, you know, there's, the, I, I think you're right in, you know, the sequence of events, something will happen. Um, and that will be, that will be the excuse that, people are waiting for to, to do this. It's not like they're gonna be surprised and say, oh, geez, we gotta do something. It's that people will believe that, right? People believe that, oh, we gotta do, and so there's no resistance. And this is exactly what's happened with the corona, right? This, the, uh, the, the idea that, that this was, you know, the things that have happened are new and the restrictions were never anticipated it's not really true. And again, going back years, you see one after another kind of um, disease panic, right? And you can see state and state media fanning the flames of these things, but not, not really catching. And finally, finally one catches on. Right? I mean, you've got um, bird flu and swine flu, and every time it seemed to get a little bit stronger, a little bit you know, more... Um, um, scary in the news and and then all of a sudden there's you know this this one that catches on and all of a sudden there's an opportunity to do all these things that have been uh, desired for some time um, okay let me interject uh, give me a thumbnail sketch overview and this is think, something i labor over it always gets back to the they in which you say who the hell are they um what is the sort of overarching goal of making us suck up all our civil liberties because of Corona. What, what, what's, what's, what's being achieved? Is it just turning us into putty heads? Is that the goal? It's the nature of democracy. People want, I mean, it's, it's this, when I mean, you look throughout history, this is the nature of the state, um, whether, whether it's democracy or monarchy or whatever, people want stuff that other people have and they, they, they take it, right? And they take it through different justifications. And one is majority, majority rule or majority voter rule. And, you know, what happens is people all end up fighting each other to get, get the stuff or to prevent other people from taking the stuff. And, you know, the they is we. If, 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 I don't believe in a collective we, but it's the people, right? They want these things or they, we wouldn't have them, right? Pres presumably people want what the state is doing or at least in the United States, I believe we could all decide that we don't want it. Uh, we could all decide we want our money. That, what's that? I'm not sure we have that power. I, you know, you say, well, well you don't want that. 
I, I don't bad candidates. Right? I don't meet people. I don't meet many people that want that power. So I believe we have it. We just don't want it. We just it's not what we want. No, again, the collective we. I don't meet many people that want to take taxing power away from the state. No, no, no. But again, um, I view the coronavirus as a clamp down on civil liberties in a very big way. Um, and it's a sort of a kabuki theater to do it. And then the question is, what is the goal of clamping down on civil liberties? What, people, what's the, people got to the point where they were afraid. And no, no, I, I get that. That's the mechanics. The vast majority why, of people. Why was that opportunity taken? And what's the goal of, of, of law? What's the goal of an overarching reduction in civil liberties? People want to feel like safe. Surveillance state. People well, want to take three different answers I got there. Well, the surveillance state is the tool, right? But if the, again, the vast majority of people that I run into are afraid and they yeah, but you make want them to afraid, stay. Eric. Don't, but well, just, sorry? You know, when you fabricate a condition, as I see it, I mean, you, you make people afraid and then people demand it. I mean, it's always, you know, it's sort of a Hegelian dialectic. You, you create well, of course, a problem. If you're, if, if, you're the, if you're the state, if you're the people, I mean, the state is a bureaucracy. Right? And if you're the people that are living off that bureaucracy, the more power that you have, the more money you make. And the, the state is naturally set up to serve up to, you know, to, 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 to benefit itself by giving people, essentially giving people what they want. You now, if you can convince people that they want to be, you know, to be restricted, to keep them safe, which people seem to believe, then you have more power. So it's a quest for power. Well, that's, what else is there? the thumbnail sketch? Quest for power. Quest for power, money, prestige, whatever you want. What else is there? Well, it's right. dopamine, <laughs> serotonin, neurotransmitters, right? Whenever people say, why does Bill Gates need this? Or why does Jeff Bezos need that? I say, they don't need more money. They need dopamine, just like the rest of us. And they know how to get it by getting more power and money. It's a question. It, you take it to the economic principle, value subjective. What people want is who knows? It's whatever they want. But right. they want what they want. And this Some is sense, the people getting what they want. They want. They want. No, but the clampdown on civil liberties is not what people want. It's the mechanism by which they achieve something they want. And your argument is power. Just pure I mean, power. If, if, if some people in my town want to put up a new school, they get out their guns and they go to all my neighbors and they take their stuff, right? That's what they want. They want a new school. They think it's a good thing. So they, they steal from people, right? And now I, I tell them, well, I would never go to my neighbor with a gun and take their couch so I can sell it and put up a school. But when you vote, that's what you're doing. And even though they recognize that, they still see it as, as something they want, so they do but, it. But they're and they, there's they, no way to monetize civil liberties, and, and they're selling our civil liberties, and they're not monetizing. They're getting every, something. Every tax is a taking of civil liberties. There's this only one kind of liberty. It's taxation. We've destroyed our tax. We've destroyed our revenue stream. We've done some real damage. So I, I'm still laboring and have been so for a very long time now, trying to figure out the quest you know, kings of yore wanted to take over the kingdom next door. I, again, dopamine, serotonin, they just wanted bigger kingdoms. It's just the human element. So I guess the same argument's true of the bureaucrats. They just wanted, these are people who want to feel more important and, and they want the power. But, but this, right. the coronavirus is a particularly bleak thing because the things they did are all destructive. And, uh, and I, I can't see where they're monetizing and I can't see, but I can see where we're giving up a ton. I can't see the win. I think this when is you, all about fear and terror. And like it is. the pumping of this mechanism with this new media sensation that we have that, you know, our exposure to media is much greater than it was before. I think through pumping this mechanism of fear and terror, I think people got absolutely terrified out of their mind that this was the second bubonic plague and that we were going to have 50% of people on the planet dying and that uh, I also believe that because of who the bureaucratics are and the stable life that they've created for themselves, I think they were super happy to sacrifice all of these civil liberties in order to try to ensure that they would be quote unquote safe. And I think the, the really sad part is, is like this played into the Chinese hand 100 percent. And like they, they were now able to conduct their Uyghur genocide without any oversight, any objections with being able to make the surveillance apparatus work. 100 percent and to me like it seems pretty clear at this point in time that i i very much believe that the ccp helped engineer all of this dialogue because they knew that with the way that they did surveillance and controlled their population they could bounce back just like they did and they knew that 
with us being Americans that we would absolutely unequivocally fuck this whole thing up and that we would make a giant catastrophic problem. In addition to like, you know, I, I really don't put it beyond the fact that it might be engineered because it, it seems very much to affect and attack, you know, the wealthiest individuals of our population, also the oldest. And there's a lot of weird shit about it. And so I think that this was a real case of people allowing their own callousness to take control of them and sacrifice these civil liberties that now that the, the Chinese have a real, they've accelerated their agenda by a decade, I believe. And now you have all these other nations who want to buy their surveillance software. They're plugging into the Chinese network. And this is extremely problematic globally at this point in time now, whereas before it was, uh, you know, I, I would say it was a problem more reserved just for the East. See, that, that, that is a monetization of the problem. That, that you just described it perfectly. And I, it's, yeah. it's taken me a while to figure out that the Chinese are the big winners and that, that, yeah. that, that their fingerprints have been all over everything for quite some time. And that, and that you can identify explicit wins for the Chinese to pull that off. So they, they knew, you know, the videos coming out of China showing the uh, horror of this disease Many of them turned out to be just fake, right? It just yeah, wasn't, you know, exactly. 10 million China mobile phones were not responsive. And right. there weren't that many dead Chinese guys. And there's they more than sufficient evidence and testimonials for that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's well, just- Well, that's all the Uyghurs that they killed. That's where they got that data from. No, no, but China was the big winner in this whole thing. They they sacrificed potentially a few people, but, but they the minute we clamped down and they knew they could trigger us to clamp down, they opened up. Guess who runs the world at that point? So there's no question that that explanation has a distinct sort of win-loss component well, to take it. A, take a European example. Um, it, you know, I, 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 I said to several people when, when these uh, restrictions started coming that these are opportunities for dictators, uh, you know, et cetera, all around the world, using fear as a way to get more control. You know, it's practically Star Wars. And... Uh, in Hungary, it only took about a year before they voted in, a, they literally voted in an enabling act, they even called it that, right, um, and created an absolute dictatorship in a country that had ruled, been ruled by both the Nazis and the communists for a long time and were very uh, seemingly opposed to that type of thing. Um, you know, they, the, the, the ruling party just waited and waited and they had an opportunity and they seized it. This, the corona gave lots of, lots of different uh, regimes around the world the opportunity to take more power. Now, you, you want to monetize that, but I don't think, you know, from, a, from an economic standpoint, money is not the, money's not value. People, people no, want power, money. Because... Power is satisfactory to me. Power as a monetization is satisfactory explanation. I buy the power. Well, basically whatever you want. Money is a medium of exchanging the things you want, and right. you know, it's a good metaphor for it, but there's things that people want and there's reasons they want them. And those reasons don't really matter. It's just that they want them. And that's what gives things value. And, you know, if somebody wants a dictatorship and this opportunity comes along, that's, that's a reason to clamp down. Um, and that's happened in several locations at this point, several countries, not just China. Um, you know, China is a, a big country with economic power, so it's, it's more visible, but um, it's not unique to them. And it's happened in the United States too. And it, it wouldn't clearly, clearly wouldn't have happened if somebody didn't value it. So the need to search for a value proposition isn't really necessary. It, it clearly is valuable because it's been done. It's not just somebody, you know, doing things they don't want to do. It's what somebody wants to do. But I get the feeling the U.S. inadvertently, it, it feels to me like the power grab was almost kind of a screw up here. Like we got duped into doing it. Well, let me ask you That's this. Why I like the China model, because China, you can say they wanted power and here's what they're going to do with it. And the whole thing makes sense. When I look at what we did to ourselves, I go, God, we just shot our own heads off. So there's a kind well, of a can, lack of logic there. You can it's say that. Just US, U.S. centric. Just you could say that with respect to most laws that are passed. Right. I know. It, right. If you if you understand economics and value, you could look at you could look at the SEC laws in the 1930s. You could look at. You know, any, any number of, you know, you could look at um, the surveillance state that was created after 9-11. You could look at these things as economically damaging. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. But there's no us. There's individual people. And some people value these things. And therefore, they happen. So it, it's not, you know, this idea that there's a single goal for society is, is never a valid idea. Everybody has their own goals. And 
the, the, this theory that there's one or maybe two goals, right? There's the left and the right goal. These are, it's, it's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lots of competing objectives. And when things happen, it's, you know, there, there's opportunities for people to, to enhance their own objectives. And w when can you point to a case in history, for example, the US, when there was an opportunity and power was reduced voluntarily by the state? It doesn't happen. The state has this inherent, and I am not a conspiracy theorist. I don't look for a group of individuals that are pulling strings, trying to make these things happen. I see these, and, and I don't reject that that may happen at times. But the point is that you don't need that explanation. This is the nature of the state. It, it right. accumulates power. And you know the foundational principles of the United States, theoretically, were a way to create a state that we felt was necessary, but give it the least amount of power possible and give, give individuals the most amount of control over that power as we could, because we understood the nature of the state. It grows, it takes power whenever it can, and it rarely gives it back. So there's no need to search for any, you know, thing that was happening behind the scenes to make this happen. This just happens when there's an opportunity. Um, and I don't see Bitcoin as a, <clears throat> as a mechanism for taking over the state. I'd be afraid of what comes next. There's always another state, right? It doesn't, it doesn't and it's not inherently better. Um, I see Bitcoin as a, you know, an anarchism in general as a way to opt out. Right. I, agree. Yeah, I see it as and a form of counter economics. It's, it's, a, it's a form of individualism, right? You can do more of what you want uh, on your own terms and not participate, right? And, and so if you see the state as a, like a mob organization, like, you know, like it is in say Southern Italy and Sicily, right? That Mussolini gave the, the, the Cosa Nostra, you know, basically state powers, he couldn't control them. So he said, we'll just make you part of the state. Um, and in parts of the world, that's how they see their governments. They're just a mom organization that, you know, takes when they want. And in the West, we don't quite see it that way because we see it as us, but they're, they're really, you know, when you see it that way, I mean, I, I can't imagine myself, you know, finding the local mob boss and asking if I could have a vote for who's, who's in charge next year. But, you know, people ask for a vote and who's in charge of the, you know, the, the protection racket we call the state. So I don't vote, right? It's not my thing. I opt out because I don't have to. I'm not compelled to. And Bitcoin gives people the way, a, a way to opt out of the monetary system to the extent that they can. Um, and that's, that is really the way I philosophically see, you know, this concept of, of anarchy, which is no state, is not taking over the state because you'll end up with another one. <laughs> it's, it's just not participating in it. I agree with that. So opting out, you mean like, uh, do you see a possibility for an emerging black market economics rooted in Bitcoin? About a 25 to 30 percent of the world's economy is estimated to be black market activity, right? In other words, not lawful activity. Um, that's a pretty large amount of economic activity. Now, I don't believe that Bitcoin could take over 100 percent of that because the People that operate in the black market have white market lives, they, and that's why they need dollars and they need to launder it so they can get it into the white market and transact, buy a house, car, whatever. Um, the same will remain true with Bitcoin as a black market money. They'll still need white market money, so it couldn't ever take over all of it. But there's, you know, presumably a lot that can and is done by people who want to transact. For example, you just want to send money to, you know, your relatives in South America or Africa or China or someplace. You, you know, Bitcoin can do that as long as you're willing to take the risk. Um, you know, I've had people in China tell me Bitcoin doesn't work in China. I can't send them money in Bitcoin. I'm like, well, that's because you're used to using these web wallets and exchanges and things that, that yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work because it's not Bitcoin. But you can do it if you want to take the risk. You set up your node and, you know, get on tour or whatever and, 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 and transact. Um, so, you know, it, that already happens. There's... There's cases that we in the, in the U.S. and in the West would see as perfectly legitimate, like sending some money to somebody, you know, that you've earned, you know, working in the U.S., remittances, that maybe the Zimbabwe government doesn't want you to do, um, or Venezuela, for example. So we see that as noble, you know, we're helping these people out. Or that, but then there's other, other things that we, 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 don't, we don't quite like so much, so we, we prevent those. Um, so, I, you know, I also... A lot of times people tend to think of everything from the perspective of, of Americans or wherever they live um, instead of the perspective of somebody in some 
country where there's really stiff currency controls. And this idea of black market is often associated with, you know, evil activity. Um, but in reality, it's just, it's people doing what they want to do as individuals, which the state doesn't want them to do. And yeah. a lot of times that's just the evil. <laughs> yeah, see, I don't see black market as evil. I agree with your analysis of black market. Just basically, it's like a person going off grid, right? In some sense, it's the person who wants to have their own solar panels and not depend on the state to deliver energy, for example. Um, I, I still worry about, so again, we're talking about crypto at a very lofty level here. We're talking about it geopolitically. We're talking about, you know, sort of uh, autonomy, anarchy, stuff like that. I do believe within the sort of the more local level, we got a bunch of Bitcoin holders who have no idea what they're doing. And it looks like they could get hurt badly depending on exactly how it plays out in this sort of short and medium term. Yeah. Well, it's not an investment. I, again, I don't even have a problem with that, except for the fact that, again, what I pick up, and part of it's because because I question Bitcoin, they come after me more than you guys. Um, I pick up this rabid group of hodlers who are just saying, you're just an old man, you don't know what you're doing. I mean, it's real troll fest. And I, I look at these people and I go, damn, you guys have targets on your asses at this point, right? It just seems very, very dangerous to me. And it's sort of like the GameStop story where the big guys are going to make the money and the little guys are going to get their asses kicked in the process, right? And so I, I, I totally understand your cryptocurrency argument in, in the sort of 35,000 foot view, the overview. I, I totally get it. Um, I just worry that along the way, it's like if you stomped on an anthill, you couldn't kill it, right? You could step on it all day. But if you look carefully, there'd be a lot of dead ants at the end of the day. Oh, and that's common too, you know, like... Uh... There's a lot of people with big mouths that, you know, I, I expect for either the state to come after them or hackers or, or whoever. Uh, and that, you know, we're in a honeymoon phase and I get it. We're all excited and happy about all the opportunity and these changes. Uh, but reality is going to show up at some point in time and some of us are going to lose some teeth over it. And, you know, let, let's not act surprised when that comes along because like, the state will do state-like things and you yeah. know the, this pie is growing too you know and and with coinbase's ipo like that that's like a new level of legitimacy for the entirety of this industry entering into the stock market and i think that's when we're going to start seeing more activity starting to be directed this way and to to eric's point earlier like we're, we're already seeing all of these layers with bitcoin but you know like exchange to exchange is essentially layer one where people don't have to worry about fees at all and then like exchange to private wallet and back is like a layer two you know i can't tell you how many people have no idea how the fee market works and they launch off a huge transaction with you know two satoshis as the payment and it never goes through and they don't understand why you know and like this successively continues and so i think we're going to see a deep stratification across the board not just within bitcoin but in the industry entirely and i won't be surprised if you know, something like Ethereum or XRP integrates directly with the state and the state just takes it over and says, hey, this is our new FedCoin. And you'll really enjoy the way that FedCoin allows for you to send money to your European friends for only $10 instead of the wire fee or whatever. You know, and so like, I, I think the the real attack is going to be pretty, pretty sneaky, I think. And a lot of people, I think, will fall for it. And you know, that, that's just my expectation. I do think you that- You guys also describe my, my sort of optimistic view of the state stepping on gold too. I, I guess my view is, is that when it finally comes time to shut down the alternative currencies, which I'll include Bitcoin and gold, what one hopes is they step in and they give you cash at that value to try to shut you down. And so if gold is roaring up at 10,000, they decide that's just too much. If we're going to shut down gold for some reason. I, I, again, I don't even understand why, what would be too much and why. Um, I would hope I'd at least get those dollar bills at that elevated price so I could find something else to hide in. I think what, um, you'd, what you'd expect to see in terms of like a, a Bitcoin uh, scenario like that is, is just simply a fork, not an alternative coin. Everything moves into you know, Ripple or something or you're going to get dollars for your Bitcoin, you'll just see incremental changes to Bitcoin for people that are in the white market and you'll still have your Bitcoin, right? It may go up in value because now it's got, you know, white market acceptance by the state, right? Stamp of approval. So it goes up in price, but the value proposition goes away. 
And people who are looking at it as a pure, you know, speculative investment probably don't care, right? As long as it's, as long as they've still got some and it's stamped as approved by the state and, you know, everybody's transacting it, you know, they're making money, they didn't lose money, fine. Um, it's, it's the people who want the value proposition of Bitcoin that will care. And those are the people in the black market. So, yeah, but here's what I think would happen. So I think Bitcoin's at some level is like Tesla. I, I make the argument Bitcoin's a better bet than Tesla because I think I can value a car company and Tesla's a stupid value. Um, I can't value Bitcoin, so I'm totally unqualified well, to say whether it's cheap or expensive, which, which is in some level logical. So, uh, so I, I, one of the things I see in the, 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 the sort of the amateur hour of Bitcoin is people, they watch someone like Musk go into Bitcoin, they think that's good news. And I just see sort of wealthy guys jumping in for a quick ride and jumping out and they hear that Stevie Cohen or someone bought Bitcoin and they get all excited. Those are weak hands to me. Those are guys who, who see something going up, they will get in. If, if it stabilizes, which I think Bitcoin has to, to do what you guys want it to do. I think it has to at some point, it's kind of stabilizing. Then the big money guys are gonna to wanna to get out because it's no longer, it's no longer a, a fun ride for them. And so then I think there'll be a regression phase where as the big money starts getting out because it's no longer a hot sort of pure commodity play there will be some sort of regression. And I don't know how big, I don't know, I don't know who owns it, but the hedge fund guys are not going to sit in Bitcoin because it's stable. They're in Bitcoin because it's really not stable right now. They, it's, it's just soaring. And I don't know how much that's influencing price. And again, for the long-term haul, long haul of crypto, it's a meaningless thing, right? It's just a, a chapter in a very big book. For the hodler who's, who's taken his, his paycheck and, and gone all in on Bitcoin, that person, again, I think is the one who's going to get hurt. Even if we think uh, as Bitcoin, uh, you know, as a unit of account, because you constantly, you know, we're talking about stability and prices. We're talking about like, you know, the switching between Bitcoin and fiat. I mean, I'm thinking a little bit ahead, maybe it's a little bit utopian still, but, uh, you know, Bitcoin is not as a medium of exchange, but a unit of account. So we, we would be thinking in purchasing power. Uh, so, you know, in a deflationary economics, would that make sense to you, uh, any of you? Would what make sense? You know, uh, using Bitcoin in a deflationary econo economics, like, you know, so the purchasing power would go up and up and up and we would pay less and less and less for better and more innovative products and services. Well, yeah, I think that's no. already, oh, go ahead, Eric. No, you go ahead, Tom. I was going to say, like, I, you know, I think we're already seeing that for individuals that hold Bitcoin. And I think existing in a fiat world with a debt based money works really, really well for Bitcoin. Uh, can everybody pile in into that world? No. Uh, does it work well when everybody piles into that world? No. Uh, is everybody going to go into that world? No. Um, so, like, I'm really comfortable with how it continues to perform. Uh, and furthermore, just by the way it does perform, like, I think this FOMO is going to go on for a while, you know, like uh, with what I'm doing, I find it really fascinating because I'm, I'm talking to big money guys who clearly don't understand the play, but people have told them to come in and do it and they're going to do right. it, right. you know, and uh, I think that's going to go on for a while. Uh, I think that they're probably going to be the first casualty. And then I think the second casualty during the 80 to 90% drawdown is going to be the believers who have their faith crushed. Um, and I also think like this is an important part of the cycle is for the extreme ex exuberance to pump it far beyond what anybody thought. And then also the extreme despondency where a lot of people who did have the conviction get out. And I think that's fine. These are all part of the market mechanisms at play. Uh, you know, for me at the end of the day, uh, number goes up is really great. It feels good. I appreciate what it does to my portfolio. And I also understand it's entirely, well, I don't want to say entirely, but a majority of it is speculative. With that being said, the, the other features of it's censorship resistant, I can, you know, purchase whatever I want without having to get permission, uh, the ability to utilize cryptography in this powerful way. I think that these are all really, really important and powerful developments that help make the internet a much more powerful vehicle for ourselves into the future. Uh, but with that being said, like 
people need to stop smoking the hopium even and it's great it feels good i totally understand it but we need to be realistic of that there will be drawdowns uh people will lose their wallet keys the state will hunt people uh and that like this isn't you know we're gonna have our first fight here after we get back from cabo and you know the honeymoon phase will conclude when we realize the very real reality that the state wants to get paid their taxes and we're going to need to do that or else uh, they're going to have some strong words for us and our motorcycles that we don't get to keep anymore. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I keep here feeling that one. Um, you get them up a lot once you get married. I, I figured that part out. Um, you do. But speaking of lost civil liberties, there's a big one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with anything. everything everyone said. I don't have any problem with anything. I I'm, I don't hear any uh, any what I think is misplaced euphoria. I do hear the idea of crypto sort of changing. What I hear is for the uh, the person whose cost basis is forty eight thousand uh, dollars. I hear great risk because the it's like in uh, if you look at civilizations and what caused them to collapse, it's not the climate being hot or cold, it's the change. The climate changes and then boom, the civilization doesn't adapt. And, and I think that as crypto goes through these changes, there's going to be, you know, head-on collisions. Um, and, and, and I don't know if it's going to be a 90% wipeout, but I think at some point crypto from some lofty level is going to regress just because that's what markets do. Um, I might become a hodler at that point, right? If I could sense that it's kind of stabilizing down there. I, I also understand what someone who's been in the game for a long time feels because I, my cost basis in gold, a major chunk of it was between 270 and 290. Now, if I own gold at 1600, it was 1800 to start selling, I'm going to feel bad. When you're sitting there at 270 to 290, you go, oh, that sucks. And that's just it. That's it. And, and one time I tried to get my dad to sell his General Electric, which was dead on correct, right? General Electric got wiped out, but he'd made like probably 40 fold over decades. How is that guy ever going to say I should sell this, right? It's just been too good to him. Well, and this is the exact scenario I see with a lot of Bitcoiners is any, anybody who's been buying after 10,000, like, yeah, like you, you should expect this drawdown event. Uh, and, you know, if you don't see it coming, I suggest you, you kind of look at the historic context. But, you know, there there is a whole slew of holders that have a very low cost basis. And this is where they want to live and what they want to develop and how their subjective unit of accounting, uh, you know, and I'm one of those people. And like I've, I've lived through bear markets where I've been upside down and I deeply questioned what was going on. And I think all of this is a really important part of the process, because truth is, is if it draws down and you know you're like look like the censorship resistance cool but i don't give a shit if i'm if i'm down 20 percent you know and i think it goes back to the classic uh, of as a speculative investment like invest what you can afford to lose uh and i think it's really awesome that some people made the extreme risk of plowing into that you know at two thousand dollars and congratulations you're you are in an excellent place figure out what your long-term living expenses are and keep riding the wave but yeah, if you have a long-term expectation that this will go up forever, never draw down, don't give you risks, that you can't get hacked, that uh, you know you can't get your head bashed in with a wrench until somebody gives you your Bitcoin, you, you got another thing coming. You need to look at your security and you need to you know stop smoking the hopium. But if you know all of those things and say, yeah, subjectively, this is a risk that I'm comfortable taking in a place being, power to you. I think that's great. And, and same thing goes for like, if you want to, plow yourself into dogecoin i think it's a fucking terrible idea but i don't know maybe elon musk has some crazy plan for the doge dog i i can't say speculation speculation so what are, what are the great things about you know uh, rising price and we, you know been in it long enough you see this is like it drives interest and it drives investment innovation in the ecosystem of bitcoin and a lot of that is misplaced i think you know if you look at the long term but um, that's a necessary part of the process. And, uh, you know, it's good to see, but um, seeing it as, you know, price is up, that's a win, price is down, that's a loss, you know, uh, that's, to me, that's not really the important thing. I mean, I, I bought, I, I have Bitcoin because I started working in it and I wanted to have some, you know, I, I wasn't investing. Um, I figured it'd be nice to be able to buy some beer every once in a while, you know, with some Bitcoin. 
um, or buy, con- you know, whenever you go to a conference, Bitcoin conference, you buy the conference tickets in Bitcoin, things th- where you can uh, just to exercise it, to use it. Um, seeing it as an investment now ties success and failure to price where I look at price and price is up. I'm like, well, this is a great opportunity for us to build more, for us to bring more people in, for us to see what it can do. Um, and the people that stick around when, you know, when things come back to earth, um, you know, uh, and are in it for the long haul, they build stuff. And I, and I, I, I'm one of those people, right? I just, I just want to build stuff and I want to see it succeed and, and price rising is just a, is just a, a measure of, of, of interest. And I like to see that. It's an interesting point you make about development. So I, I've made on a number of occasions, the argument that that the occasional mania is a plus, because I think it's not a bad idea to occasionally squeeze every last stupid idea out to see if they work. And so I look at the dot-com bubble, and I think the Federal Reserve was disastrously ignorant of what was happening. But at the same time, while we were inventing pets.com, we were inventing amazon.com, we were inventing some real ones. And so I don't think it's a bad idea to to scrub every dark corner clean of, of, of potentially risky ideas. I think to do it every seven years, the way the Fed is engineered is a disaster. And I think the most recent bubble that we're currently in is a total disaster because I don't think it led to any real innovation. Bitcoin aside, um, if you look at this current mania, it's, it's, it's founded on nothing. It's, it's put, put it this way, I totally understand Bitcoin a whole lot more than I understand the current equity mania and the bond mania and stuff. It, 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 there's just no logic to it. I thank the Federal Reserve for that one. And I think they're incredibly ignorant of that. There, that is an absolutely unconstructive um, overdevelopment of anything. So, but I, I'll defend the, the dot com bubble. I'll say, yeah, you know, that was a kind of a revolutionary time. And, we blew a lot of money trying a lot of crazy stuff, but but we came out of it with cell phones and all sorts of stuff. So internet, all sorts of stuff. And that, that's uh, how I feel about the development in, in Bitcoin right now. Is, that's right. You know, that's right. Nine, 95 to 98 percent of the stuff going on is absolute garbage, but there is you know two percent of really interesting stuff that goes somewhere and develops. Uh, with that being said, you know, I, I do think that there, there's a speculative mania fear, mania fear and that like that can eat up everything. And I fear that more than I have in any of the other cycles thus far. Um, but, you know, I, I'm excited to, to see how it all plays out because this is a lot better than a world without Bitcoin because I have no idea what would be going on without it at this point. Yeah. And I wanted to actually, you know. The gold would be going up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... I've taken enough time of you guys. Um, let me just wrap this up. Um, I mean, with all the institutions now coming in and you know it's co- becoming mainstream. I mean, is there is there as you call it, Eric? Case you know, hopium. Is there a hopium for uh, you know for a better future, for a brighter future? Like I wanted to go into that that aspect. Like, will could Bitcoin defund you know the monopoly on? violence, aggression, coercion, or, you know, taxation <laughs> and warfare, um, you know, talking about the military industrial complex, but that's a, a chapter for itself probably. And... I mean, I, I think all these things will in the dirt, like I don't see them anytime in the next decade. Uh, you know, and I think this is much more a focus on actual ability of what people start doing when they understand peer-to-peer cryptography and what that totally enables, but that this is a huge generational shift that I see as being the step beyond where we're at right now. And there's also a very substantial risk of that, like this can all get, get lost in the transition. Um, you know, for me, part of the, the hope of Bitcoin is utilizing this sort of technology to make breakthroughs in the way that people can communicate, that people can choose to protect their privacy, that people can choose to protect their wealth. And I think it, it does offer a radical new answer in a way that we can actually really utilize the internet to start creating some semblance of a, a kind of commonwealth or, or a, a new kind of digital legal medium, if you will, or jurisdiction. But I do think that that's still decades away at this point in time. All right, Dave, Eric, Vasco, any final thoughts? Appreciate that. Uh, I think we got years of turmoil ahead of us. 
And I think that probably is, is going to make those of us who are who are positioning ourselves defensively look pretty smart in the end. I'm kind of a fourth turning guy. Um, I, I, not, not that I follow it rigorously. I think they try to make it too systematic, but I think the general idea that we're heading into a, a generation that's gonna try to blow its, all its limbs off before we're done, I think we're not done. Uh, I think we've got a lot of purging left. I fear what the final blow off of this fourth turning is going to be. It could be, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to die of COVID before we have, end up in a, a, a hot war with China. Um, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll go to the light and watch it from up there or something. Um, I don't want to be around for that. Um, and that's the type of thing you get. And so, and, and again, Americans are so used to thinking, well, that doesn't happen here. If you follow, um, you, if you read about a rise of authoritarian states, that word's come up a lot today. Uh, I think we're right, we're right on the script perfectly. We might only be in the first 5%, but as a uh, guy named James Lindsay says, he says, look, it's just a seed of authoritarianism, but um, it's not like an, an oak tree, it's just an acorn, but, but, but would you plant it, water it, and fertilize it? No, you should, you should try to stop it. And I, I do think we are heading for, we're, we're great risk of doing something that Americans thought was not even possible in this country. And, um, and I don't know what a civil war would look like. I don't think, I don't think using the, the old one as a model is, is at all relevant because that was a clear battle line. I don't know what the battle line is gonna be, but I've, I've seen a lot of violence and there's a lot of hatred out there. And so, um, so whether you own Bitcoin or gold or real estate or whatever, I don't think you want to be buying Tesla. That's that's my yeah. opinion. And the surveys is, is interesting. I mean, uh, the, or shocking, actually. 25, 30% of the U.S. population thinks a civil war is more than likely. I mean, compared to whatever, many years ago. Isn't that like a shocker to a lot of people? Well, except for if you actually look at what's going on, you, you can see the beginnings of it, right? There's There's a there's a vanquishing your opponent mentality and that's the cancel culture. And, and so, um, and so I think everyone can see this and I think they can see that that really is the right left divide, which I agree is artificial. Um, I have a, an occasional every couple of weeks chat with the guy who's super polar opposite. I mean, we can sit there for hours and talk about this stuff and we just find our overlap. We find out where we disagree and it's very little, but somehow, our two respective teams are now fighting like cats and dogs. And so that's, that's the fundamental problem. I don't know. I don't know how we get out of it before we trash the bar. Right. Very realistic assessment. Eric Vasco, any final thoughts? Future is uncertain. <laughs> True. Always a rational. You nailed it. <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein isn't dead. <laughs> Actually, I think he's still alive, but that's my opinion. So do I. Okay. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I got to, you know, re-listen to this, I think, one more time at least. And, uh, yeah, make my own uh, mind up. And, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope we can continue this next time. Send us a link when you have it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed the chat. Thanks, Eric. You're Eric, welcome. Dave, bye. Hey, so how'd you like this conversation? This panel is crushed. I really super enjoyed this talk with Dave Collum, Eric Case, and Eric Roscoe. You know, great thinkers. Um, I hope I'm going to have them soon in near future for another panel discussion so we can go into a little bit different tangents because it went a little bit different direction which i had intended but you know it was all perfect for this episode and you know for me it's all about real like uh freedom individual sovereignty and uh evolution on every level you can think of you know societal technological scientific structural economical and what I really envision is with Bitcoin is to create more and more, uh, whatever you want to call it, black market localized economies with deflationary prices. So we pay less and less and less, but for better, more innovative uh, 
products and services and we you know finally usher into a new era of zero to one technologies we create abundance and uh, you know for for everybody uh, equal opportunities for everybody um, and we can have that it's just that the centralized systems starting with the nation states governments you know central banks the military industrial corporate complex it's a you know it's very complex so we need to you know sometimes zoom out and see what are the root problems what are the root causes so this is what i wanted to go into but it was really a really fascinating discussion really huge thanks to dave Collum, eric case and eric basquill if you have any questions or any wishes desires or suggestions for any future episodes uh, with special guests just let me know for a special panel discussion um, and my email is open for you, kd at kvandavani.com, or just DM me. Make sure you follow Eric Case, Neri Raskirill, and Dave Column on Twitter. I'm going to put the, all the links in the show notes. And thank you so much again for your support. I'll see you soon again. Bye.